Hi, my name's Keith. I'm one of the leaders here at Emmanuel Church Durham, and it gives me great pleasure to continue our series today on 1 Kings. And I'm going to be focusing specifically on chapters 5 and 6, which is where we see Solomon building the temple. The, the temple which was to become the focal point of, uh, of the faith of the nation uh, for many, many years to come. To put it into context, David had been king. David his, uh, had died and he had tasked his son Solomon to become king after him. And he had said to him, I want you to build a temple for God. And he drew up plans and he made resources available, but he left that task for Solomon to do. So Solomon, in his fourth year of his reign, he started to build a temple for God. And some experts would put that at around about 965 BC. Now this temple stood for about 400 or so years until uh, Nebuchadnezzar II of uh, Babylon uh, came and, and invaded uh, Judah as it was at that point. Uh, he laid siege, or his armies laid siege to Jerusalem for about two and a half years and uh, eventually uh, the walls fell and the armies ransacked Jerusalem. They destroyed the temple, they pulled down the walls and uh, Jerusalem was very much left in ruins and the people were taken into exile. Sometime later they came back from exile and uh, through the work of uh, uh, Nehemiah and, uh, and Zerubbabel and others they, uh, they, they started to rebuild the walls and eventually they started to rebuild the temple. And then that temple stood in one form or another and it was given a, a refurbishment shall we say by Herod the Great and that is called the second temple and that's the temple that Jesus will have walked around that's the temple where in the marketplace Jesus threw out and overturned the the market sellers because they turned his father's house from a place of prayer into a place of, of, of trading but that temple was also destroyed and in the year 70 AD the Romans came and after a revolt they, uh, they again they ransacked Jerusalem and destroyed the temple now this isn't just a historical telling of the story of building the temple because the beauty of scripture is it doesn't matter what bit you're reading there is something in there that points you to Jesus or points you to look at yourself and your walk and your relationship with Jesus and the same is true here with chapters 5 and 6 and the building of the temple as we read it we can see and we can draw bits out of it elements that, that can influence our life today and how we live our lives today. But one of the key things that I want to draw out is, as I've already said, there was Solomon's temple, then there was Herod the Great's temple. Both of those temples have been destroyed. God decided in his infinite uh, majesty, he decided that he would allow himself to be uh, situated for want of a better expression in the temple and that was called the house of God but God is infinite God is bigger than the universe God holds the universe in his hands and it's not God's will to be constrained within within a building but rather with the the life of Jesus with Jesus being part of the Godhead coming to earth walking on earth as a man dying on the cross as a man being resurrected and now being in heaven through that amazing act what we see in scripture is we see that that the Godhead dwelled in the form of a man essentially instead of the Godhead dwelling instead of God dwelling in the temple of Solomon or the temple of Herod he dwelt in Jesus the man and when Jesus went to heaven he sent his Holy Spirit and that that comes at Pentecost and uh, we see that in the beginning of Acts the book of Acts but at that point what happened was that that calling that that, that fulfillment of the temple being in Jesus also comes to us so now we are the body of Christ on earth we are the temple so the temple's not a set of, uh, a set of stones in Jerusalem the temple is you and me if you're a believer in Christ if you follow Jesus you are a temple of the Holy Spirit and scripture tells us uh, in Colossians 1 it says for God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him again in Colossians 2 for in Christ all the fullness of the deity the Godhead lives in bodily form 
But then if we look in uh, 1 Corinthians, we'll see this. 1 Corinthians 3 says, do you not know? This is Paul speaking to people like you and me. And he says, do you not know that you are God's temple and that God's spirit dwells within you? 1 Corinthians 6 says, or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you? And Ephesians 2 says, I, sorry, it says, in him you also are being built together into a dwelling place for God by the Spirit. The verses in Colossians talk about Jesus being the temple, Jesus' body. God lived in Jesus in bodily form. Corinthians tells us that we are God's temple now through the Holy Spirit dwelling within us. And Ephesians 2 is talking about how us collectively, you are being built, you also, how us collectively, how the church is the temple of God. So when I'm speaking here about the, the, Jerusalem's te uh, the temple of Solomon in Jerusalem, I'm not talking about stones, but what we're going to see is all of the amazing detail in 1 Kings 5 and 1 Kings 6. That applies to us. And there are some challenges in there. And as I've been preparing this, there have been things that I myself have been challenged by. So let's carry on. But 1 Kings 6 says, In the fourth year, the foundation of the house of the Lord was laid. And in the eleventh year, the house was finished in all its parts. It was seven years in building it. Scripture then goes on to say in the next verse, uh, chapter 7, verse 1. And then later on in chapter 9, verse 10. It says Solomon was building his own, ha own house for 13 years. At the end of 20 years, Solomon had built the two houses, the house of the Lord and the king's house. So Solomon built two buildings. He built the temple for seven years. He then built his own house for 13 years. But nonetheless, he spent 20 years building the temple and his own house. But you know what? He built the temple first. And there's a lesson there for each and every one of us. Are we building God's house first? Or are we building our own house? You know, are we building the, the, the temple of God? That's the church locally. That's the church, the wider church. That's us individually. Or are we building our own comfort? The commentator Matthew Henry puts it like this. We ought to prefer God's honour before our own ease and satisfaction. I'll read that again. We ought to prefer God's honour before our own ease and satisfaction. He built God's house first, and that's a lesson for all of us. Let's put our energies into God's house first. 1 Kings 6 also says, The inner sanctuary was 20 cubits long, 20 cubits wide, and 20 cubits high. Now, 20 cubits is about 30 foot, or just over 9 metres. And he overlaid it with pure gold. He also overlaid an altar of cedar. And Solomon overlaid the inside of the house with pure gold, and he drew chains of gold across in front of the inner sanctuary, and overlaid it with gold. There's a lot of gold going on here. And he overlaid the whole house with gold, until all the house was finished. Also, the whole altar that belonged to the inner sanctuary, he overlaid with gold. This was an, uh, a remarkable structure. And again, you can look at artist impressions online and you'll see the cutaways and it's all gold inside. And we can learn from that as well. Solomon used the best. He used the most expensive materials in building their temple of God. And so the question that I have to ask myself, and I'd encourage you to do the same, is this. Am I giving the best of my effort, the best of who I am? the best of my energy, the best of my time, the best of my resources? Am I giving my best to building God's temple? Whether that's the temple of God as in me individually, the temple of God as in the church, or the temple of God as in the wider worldwide church. So again, am I using the best for my own benefit? 1 Corinthians 9 says, Do you not know that in a race all the runners run? But only one receives the prize, so run that you may obtain it. It's about giving the best. Philippians 3 says, I press on to take hold of all that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. But one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining toward what is ahead, I press on towards the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward 
in Christ Jesus. It's again, that emphasis of straining, that emphasis of I push, I want to give my best to God. 2 Timothy 4, I have fought the good fight, I have finished the race, I have kept the faith. I have fought the good fight. Again, giving your best. I won't surprise you to notice that the inner sanctuary, the most holy place, was also inlaid with gold. But this was the place that no one ever saw. Only the high priest would go in, and that would be once a year on the Day of Atonement. So people weren't seeing this. This was hidden away behind a big thick curtain. And yet it was still all covered with gold and covered with fancy ornate uh, uh, coverings. And that raises a question for me. And, and this one was the one that I struggled with in many respects. I've had to really, really ask myself some deep questions here. The things of God, that most holy place, it was hidden away and yet it still got the best. Do I save the best of my time, the best of my effort, the best of my resource for the things that no one else can see? Or am I saving the best for the things that people can see? Am I, am I doing my best giving towards God when people can see it or when people can't? And that really challenged me, that idea of, is my best being given even though no one can see it? Or is it really for show? And I've had to give that a lot of thought because there have been times when I think I've fallen foul of, uh, of, of only giving my best when people can see it. So Jesus himself spoke about this in Matthew 6. He said, beware of practising your righteousness before other people in order to be seen by them. Jesus knew the risks of only putting your, your best into it when people can see. And he, he said, don't do that. You know, don't let your right hand know what your left hand is doing, but rather do, do, do stuff in secret. Do it so that it's just you and God, because then you do it from a place of humility. So that's been a real challenge for me over the years and, and still now. One final thing to notice is the detail within the building. So I've said that it was all inlaid with gold, but one of the things that Solomon did was he decorated the inside of the building. And it says, the cedar within the house was carved in the form of gourds and open, open flowers. A bit later, round the walls of the house he carved engraved figures of cherubim and palm trees and open flowers in both the inner and the outer rooms. He covered the two doors of olive wood with carvings of cherubim, palm trees and open flowers. I don't think that was done just to look nice. I don't think that was done just because, you know, one nice bit of scenery. I, I think that was done to remind people when they approached this building, when they approached the temple of God, of the fact they were approaching the creator, the wonderful creator, the awesome God. And these flowers, the cherubim, was just a way of, of saying, look, this is our creator. And I want to encourage you, and again, it's for me as well, let's surround ourselves, especially at this time when things are quite challenging. Let's surround ourselves with positive testimonies of the amazing things that God's doing. God's doing amazing things all the time. God is on the move. God is working in power. Uh, you know, we, we see people being healed. We see people's provision, their need being met. We see God speaking into the lives of people and bringing forgiveness and bringing health and wholeness and, and just bringing love into their lives. And all of these things are amazing uh, testimonies of the love of God. But let's surround ourselves with these testimonies. Let's encourage one another with these testimonies. If you've got a testimony of God's grace in your life, and share it with others. And the same, if you're, you know, if, if you're looking for encouragement, find someone with a testimony and get them to share it with you again so that you can be encouraged in the love of God. Because God is doing things all the time. So let's listen to that. Let's surround ourselves with the good things of God. So to sum up, the building of the temple was something that Solomon did thousands of years ago, but it speaks to our lives now. The temple is no longer made of stones and wood, but living stones. Jesus, his church and us as individuals. Our first and best efforts should go on building the kingdom of God. We should be careful of pride and that we're not doing our works for God purely so they can be seen by others. 
and we should surround ourselves with stories of God's love, grace and power because he's on the move and we can encourage ourselves in that. Finally, just a quick message. If you don't know Jesus or if you're not sure, I want you to ask yourself the following question. Is my relationship with Jesus as real as my relationship with the person or the people that I live with, I work with or I socialise with? If the answer to that question is no, then I can I encourage you to pray this prayer. Jesus, I don't know if you're there, but I have heard that you want to have a living relationship with us. If you are there, please show yourself to me today in some way that I may find you and invite you in. And if you want to find out more about all this, then why not join the Alpha course that starts this coming Thursday at 7pm. Thank you.